What's up everyone, it's Dr. J here, and it is week 12, mindfulness-based stress reduction. I barely know what week it is anymore, I barely know what day of the week it is anymore. This quarantine self-isolation thing has definitely taken its toll on me, but we got mindfulness. I hope you're using mindfulness like I'm using mindfulness, applying what we talk about here in the course, because there's a lot of adjustments going on as we get to this new normal day-to-day, um, and it can cause some anxiety, like we talked about last week, but it can also cause some lower mood states, which is what we're talking about this week. We're talking about how mindfulness can help us manage depression in lower mood states. Um, we won't be doing any yoga this week. Can leave the yoga mat where it was. I hope you're still practicing. Plenty of great tutorials on YouTube, but you will need a piece of paper and a writing utensil. And also grab an envelope, if you got one, if you don't have one, that's okay. But without further ado, let's get into it. Alrighty, well mindfulness for depression and low mood states. Gosh, I really love this photo over here on the right hand side. Embracing the moment, knowing, and as we've talked about, how we can't always control the weather that's gonna come through in our lives, but we certainly can pay attention to it, embrace it, be with it, as opposed to avoiding it, which is what mindfulness is all about, being with whatever is in the moment. A little bit about depression. So depression impacts over 16 million adults in the US. That's about 7% of the population, a large amount of people. The top five depressive disorders. So not all these are disorders anymore. They might go by different names. You might be like seasonal depression. That used to be called seasonal affect disorder. The new DSM-5 has kind of tweaked these, but these are kind of the five major forms dep depression will come in. Um, the first and kind of most popular form is called major depressive disorder. Uh, the symptoms for major depressive disorder, MDD, we'll talk about on the next page. But the important thing to know is having MDD persists of having this cluster of symptoms for at least two weeks. It's not having one bad day, one low mood, or just having a couple things happen to you that made you sad for a couple days. It's an extended period of lowness, of feeling this depression for at least two weeks. And we'll cover some of those symptoms going forward. Persistent depressive disorder, again, new for the DSM-5. It used to be called dysthymia. You might have heard that term before. Dysthymia is basically the perfect representation of the character Eeyore. So if you think about what Eeyore was like, he was kind of mopey, kind of in a gray mood, but people with persistent depressive disorder have this persistent lowness, this grayness that lasts at least two years. And so they're pretty much all the time carrying around at least a symptom or two of major depressive disorder. They kind of just stay in this gray zone, so a persistent low mood state. Bipolar disorder is very different. People confuse bipolar disorder a lot with borderline personality disorder. I'm not gonna go crazy into those details. It's not <laughs> necessary for this course, but people often think if somebody is labile, so they have rapidly changing emotions, that they are like, oh, I'm bipolar. That isn't bipolar. That probably best fits borderline personality disorder, but it could fit a variety of other disorders. Bipolar disorder is moving between two distinct mood states. One is depression, which is what we're talking about, right? A low persistent mood state. And then the other mood state is this elevated state, which is either manic or hypomanic. And basically the biggest difference between mania and hypomania is mania puts people in an emergency type state. It is considered a crisis type state when somebody is in a manic episode and they can do a lot of behaviors that could put themselves at risk or others at risk. They just feel like they're moving a thousand miles an hour, their thoughts are racing and everything for them is just sped up. So hypomanic is just a lower level of this. It's not considered a crisis state, but they experience this elevation. Um, maybe they don't feel the need to sleep as much. Maybe their thoughts are a little bit racing, but 
overall, people in a hypomanic state can go about their daily activities. They can go to work. They can do their normal social life. It doesn't drastically impact. But someone in a manic episode, wow, it impacts everything. Their social life, their work life. Um, they might even skip work or school. So big difference in those two. And if bipolar type 1 is when you're having full manic episodes and depression. Bipolar type 2 is when you have hypomanic episodes and depression. Um, the fourth most common way depression comes up used to be called seasonal affect disorder is now just called seasonal depression. I put season depression. <laughs> that should be seasonal depression. But it's the depression that normally occurs coming into autumn and lasts through winter. Um, there's a lot of different theories out there of why this exists. It could be because of a lack of sunlight, could be lack of vitamin D. Um, but this happens obviously in more cold weather type states. Um, down here in South Florida where the sun's shining through the winter, I would bet the rate of people with seasonal depression tends to be pretty low. Uh, postpartum depression, this is super, super common. Um, otherwise known as baby blues. It's said that up to 80% of women after they have their baby, their child, that they can experience this depression, this low. Um, the good news is it typically passes within a week or two, but for some individuals to help move through this time, or if it's extending longer than that, um, they may seek help to kind of move through that depressive state. Depressive symptoms. Here are kind of the classic depression symptoms um, that when we think about depression, how do we know if someone has a depression? This is what we look for. And so therapeutically, do you have to have all these? Does it matter if you meet full criteria for major depressive disorder? No, it doesn't. And I always try to encourage people, just because you don't meet criteria for a disorder doesn't mean you shouldn't seek out therapy. It doesn't mean that you can't gain or benefit from therapy. Um, maybe some of these symptoms you have a few of and therapy could be helpful to you or some of these practices that we're doing could be helpful to you uh, regardless of whether you're having a low mood state or not. But classic depressive symptoms, loss of interest or decreased pleasure in activities. That's a hallmark one. Um, people just won't, <laughs> there's sort of this emo image on the right hand side of someone just lounging in the rain, swinging on the swing set. It oddly put a smile on my face because I thought it was such an interesting photo but people just won't be doing the same things they used to anymore you know maybe they really enjoyed going to the gym and now they're just like not in the mood or they used to enjoy socializing playing video games or reading books or whatever it is but they just feel kind of blah and they don't have the same interest or motivation towards these activities they used to do um, another hallmark symptom having the depressed mood most of the day nearly every day so that's a big distinguishing factor from just kind of being in a low mood state, you know, that, you know, maybe you feel it, you know, once a week before you go to a class that you really hate. Um, you know, it's not to say that that should be minimized or pushed aside, but depression is almost every day um, throughout the week that you feel this sadness. It could be this emptiness, this hopelessness. Um, it's there and it's lasting, like we said, for a few weeks at least. Fatigue. Again, we can all get tired at times, but having fatigue that lasts, again, for weeks on end, it could be a symptom, an indication of some depression. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. You'll see this a lot, especially as I work with people in therapy and we go into their cognitions, what they're thinking about. They will just feel really bad about themselves. They'll feel really guilty about things that you know, in being a neutral observer as their therapist listening to them, they'll be like, well, I'm not sure why you'd feel guilty about something like that. That doesn't sound like something that um, is your fault or that you should be so wrapped up in. Um, but depression, again, as we'll talk about going forward, hijacks a lot of our cognitions and makes us feel like, again, that we need to worry about a lot more things and take responsibility because we don't feel good about ourselves. Um, decreased concentration and or indecisiveness. You can imagine if you're feeling sort of this low mood state that it's difficult to concentrate. If your cognitions are making you think about stuff where you feel guilty or down or worthless, I mean, it can be hard to pay attention in class. 
It can be hard to make decisions for yourself. Depression also will and often does impact your sleep. And it can go either way. You can have insomnia where, again, you're staying up and it's hard for you to fall asleep, stay asleep. The opposite is also true. It may be really hard for you to wake up. You may be sleeping most of the day all day, which again, a lot of people don't think of that as a sign of depression, but if you're sleeping a lot, it certainly could be. Changes in weight, losing weight or gaining weight, either side of that can be a a symptom of depression. And then getting to the cognitions, reoccurrent thoughts of death, and or suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, super common, even in people who have more of a mild to moderate depression can be having suicidal thoughts, thoughts of ending their life, which is really serious and is something that you shouldn't brush aside. You shouldn't bury that um, deep within yourself. Expressing that, talking that out with somebody is super important. Because a lot of times when we have thoughts like that, we can feel shameful. It can make us even feel worse about ourselves. But it's a common occurrence in depression. And that's important and empowering to know that this is part of the symptomology of depression and that you can get better. So how does mindfulness impact depression? Well, mindfulness in depression research has gained a lot of momentum in the past 20 years. Um, Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is kind of on the forefront of doing a bunch of different studies of how we've known for a long time cognitive behavioral therapy is a great um, therapeutic orientation that helps depression. But this is incorporating a lot of the stuff that we do, a lot of the mindful breathing, body scan, uh, mindful communication, mindful eating, all the different mindfulness practices that we've been doing throughout this course, they do in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, But how does it work? How exactly does mindfulness help with depression? Well, like we talked about, in the cognitions, when you talk with somebody who's depressed, there's usually... Uh, this hallmark feeling bad about yourself, being stuck on sort of negative thinking. Could be negative views about the world, negative views about the future, negative views about the self. But when you're wrapped up, and the term we use a lot in psychology is brooding, brooding on this negative thought, which just is just another way to say that this thought is going around and around in your mind a lot. Like, what's the point in all this? What's the point in me being at school? I'm just going to mess this up anyways. Well, mindfulness interrupts this cognitive negative thought loop, this brooding, and it pulls people into the present. And as we've talked about over and over again, mindfulness is a great interrupter of some of our negative cognitive processes. We've already talked about how it's great for interrupting anxiety, pulling us into the present, activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps calm us, regulate us. Um, And it does the same for depression. It pulls people into the moment. So when you get pulled back into the moment, when you're stuck in all this depressive thinking, the beauty is that people report who are in these low mood states or depressive states that they feel back in control of the environment, that they can respond to the environment and make decisions for themselves, whether that's setting boundaries with other people, saying no to others, not absorbing a bunch of stressful tasks, but they are back with their hands in the control panel Um, and away from depression kind of running their life, which is a beautiful thing. And mindfulness allows people to be in the present with others and fully engage. You will see this often with people who have sunk into a depression that they avoid a lot. You know, if you can imagine, maybe you haven't been through depression yourself, but if you're stuck with this negativistic thinking about the world, about yourself, about others, It would be so hard to engage with other people in front of you. So you'd feel disconnected a lot. But practicing mindfulness allows us to be present with others and not avoid. Not avoid people, avoid the world, stay in our dorm rooms, stay in our apartments, our homes. But it allows us to, again, have our hands on the controls and move forward and engage with people, which is one of the best ways to move through depression, is to have people around us who support us, who we can talk to, who we can connect with, which is no surprise, psychotherapy, just engaging, connecting with the therapist, being there in the moment is therapeutic in itself. 
So let's jump into this glad meditation. Glad is a metaphor that we're gonna talk about as we flow through this meditation, but this is an awesome meditation to help with depression. Wherever you are out there, just make sure you get in a nice, comfortable position to start. Maybe you're practicing that traditional meditative pose, cross-legged in a posture that represents dignity, slowly tucking the chin. Maybe if you want to signify some wakefulness, you just get in a nice erect posture, straightening out the back a little bit, lowering that chin down, gently closing your eyes. But wherever you are, laying on the couch, laying in your bed, just get comfortable in this moment. And just begin as we do many times over by noticing how you're feeling in this moment. Noticing your energy level, is it high, is it low? Noticing any emotions, whether you feel anxious, sad, content, excited. And just noticing already, where are your cognitions? Are you in thinking mode or mind been lately? And go ahead, connect and activate that parasympathetic system that slows us down by taking a nice, slow, deep inhale through the nose, really letting that air reach the base of the lungs, and then just slowly exhaling out completely and slowly through the mouth. Taking another nice, slow inhale in, you might feel your shoulders rise, your chin rise, and then deliberately breathing out, sighing out through the mouth all the way. Maybe begin to notice your thoughts slowing down, coming more and more into this moment together. Taking that last clearing breath in, nice, big, and deep, using our breath to gain control now, feeling our body sink down, maybe our shoulders come down, just coming into this stillness that we're cultivating together. And then as we move to our glad meditation, starting with the G in glad, we cultivate gratitude together. And we do this by allowing your mind to think of one thing that you're grateful for today. It could be something simple like having food and water. It could be having your home, a place of shelter. It could be someone in your life that you're grateful for. But just allow your mind to wrap around something or someone that you are grateful for in this moment. Picturing this thing, this person, in front of you, maybe even cultivating a little smile on your face as you extend this gratitude for you having this thing, this protection, this person in your life. Taking a nice deep breath in, imagining this thing, this person in the mind Breathing out all the stress, all the worry that can take us different places. Keeping this nice deep breathing going forward as we transition from this place of gratitude and we move to the L. And allow your mind to think of one thing that you learned today. It could be something that you learned about yourself some insight you gained, some wisdom that you possessed. It could be some knowledge, a fact, something even from class so far. But just allow your mind to cultivate this growth, this learning, and allow yourself to highlight what you've learned. Taking a nice, slow, deep inhale in, breathing in this curiosity, this growth. 
exhaling out completely, letting go into this moment as we celebrate the fact of our continuous growth through learning. And then transitioning to the A in GLAD and thinking about one thing you accomplished today. It could be a small accomplishment, something as simple as waking up this morning, getting enough sleep last night, maybe not skipping any meals, taking care of yourself, maybe coming here and listening to class, tuning in, taking care of your mental health by practicing this meditation but just allowing your mind to cultivate and honor something that you've accomplished today. Small things can be celebrated like taking out the trash, spending time with our pets, the littlest things that allow us to move forward. Taking this nice deep breath in, breathing in this accomplishment, which We can so often forget about the little things we do. Exhaling out all the worry that can plague our minds and tell us we're not good enough. Sticking with this accomplishment. Celebrating it internally as we keep breathing in nice and deep. As we transition to the D in the GLAD meditation, And allow your mind to transition to one thing that delighted you or touched you today. Could be something that made you laugh, made you smile, brought you joy. Could be something really simple like hearing the birds chirp in the morning, seeing beautiful artwork in your home, maybe seeing a funny meme online but just allowing your mind to wrap around something that delighted you, that brought you some joy today. Picturing this thing in your mind, maybe it was the food you had earlier today, somebody you interacted with, but keeping this delighted energy in your mind and taking that slow, nice, deep inhale through the nose. And then breathing out, exhaling out. All the brooding, all the worry of the mind. Just allowing us to stay with the glad that we cultivated through our gratitude, through our continuous growth and learning through our accomplishments, our perseverance that we do each day that can go unnoticed and the delights in our life, no matter how big or how small. Just allowing ourselves to move through these different phases of the GLAD meditation and connecting back with one more clearing breath Slowly inhaling through the nose this moment. Breathing out completely. Letting go of all the different places our mind can take us. And wherever you are, slowly opening your eyes, moving your hands, your feet. And pausing just for a moment, noticing how you feel cultivating this glad, moving through these different phases of the meditation, noticing where your energy is, noticing how you feel emotionally in this moment after the meditation. Well, I hope you enjoyed the GLAD meditation. And if you want to use the steps in GLAD as sort of a written exercise, I'll include the different things to reflect on uh, in the description of this video. It can be an awesome way each day to move through something you're grateful for, something that you learned, accomplished, something that delighted you. It could be an awesome exercise to work through, even in notes in your phone. 
just to reflect on the day. Talking about writing, this is our next exercise. You're gonna need a piece of paper. This is an awesome way for us to have cathartic emotional release. And I really, really love this exercise. So too often in low mood states, we can have a real negative voice in our head. Sometimes we call this voice the critic and it can be really hard and critical on us, beating us down for just being human, going about our days, any little mistakes that we can make. This is the opposite of that. This is cultivating that compassionate voice with inside ourselves. And we can do that through journaling, through writing. A lot of research benefits for us using journaling for stress reduction, for anxiety relief. And so we're gonna practice it today. And so here are a few different prompts that you can use as we go into our writing exercise. Any of them will do. One of them is, what is something you did well lately? Just writing about that, honoring that, spending, spending some time putting that down on paper, taking it through, painting the picture of that story. Another one you could do is, what would the compassionate coach inside you say to help you during this time? Maybe there's something you're stressed out about. Maybe there's something you feel low about. What would this compassionate coach, if we're cultivating it inside of you, how would they guide you through this time? And sort of another angle on that, what lessons can be gained from this experience that you are going through right now that could help you grow rather than hold you down? So sometimes the critical voice in our head will catastrophize a situation and say, we're going to be stuck, we're going to fail at school, it's going to get worse. But let's look at the other side of that. What are the lessons and how could you grow through this experience, through anything that you're going through right now that can help you move forward, achieve your dreams and your goals? So go ahead, get a piece of paper out. I'm going to play some music. You're going to see some nice footage of me working through the exercise and we'll process it here in a few.
curious what this experience was like for you. I know for me, anytime I slow down and journal, it's such a cathartic release. And I'm also curious, what prompt did you pick? I picked the first one. I did the, what is something you did well lately? I know I can become super critical of myself and kind of stuck in that mindset. So it felt so awesome to slow down and write and highlight something I did well, something that I'm proud of myself for, no matter how big or small that is. But let me know in the comments down below in this video, what prompt did you pick? Which one of these spoke to you? And let me know how that experience was for you. Um, this is what I like to do. After I'm done writing them, I like to grab an envelope, seal it up, I can get it in there. Seal it up and I write future Justin on the outside. And this is so crazy, but I hide them places. I put them in books that I frequently use. I put them in little notebooks. I put them in different book bags and backpacks that I sometimes use, but I like to find them because they remind me of different moments in my life, whether it's some wisdom I want to remember or just to cultivate that compassionate coach. And it's so crazy ironic because as I was writing this, I actually, discovered one in one of my favorite books, The Mindfulness Toolbox. A lot of great, great stuff in here. Um, the Glad Meditation was in here, which I really, really like. But right in the dead middle as I was flipping through, I don't know if you can see that or not, Future Justin. So crazy, it was so awesome, and it was neat to read. It's something I wrote to myself when I was teaching one of the mindfulness courses at FAU Counseling Center. So it's such a cool throwback, and it made me smile. So. I hope whatever you decide to do with yours, you can hide them somewhere, seal them somewhere. You can put them all together if you want, or you can be weird like me and have little surprises to find as you go throughout your life. I hope you enjoyed that. Writing isn't something we've done a lot in this course so far. I love incorporating it. For those of you who are in that class, the one day where I realized I didn't bring enough pens, this was part of an activity that we were gonna do. We're gonna do a gratitude writing activity, which maybe we'll incorporate here in a little bit, because I know you have writing utensils wherever you are at home, but I didn't think through when a lot of you would come to my Friday class. You were traveling light, which I appreciate, just bringing your mat, bringing your <laughs> positive attitude as we met so early in the morning. But let's get to the last meditation, which is so, so helpful. Um, when we move through low mood states, whether it's depression or any type of, type of feeling that has us feeling a little bit more bogged down. And this meditation is called sheltering from the storm. And for this meditation, I recommend laying all the way down. It's a great meditation to give way into gravity, get super relaxed wherever you are. And so go ahead and get into that nice reclining position and turn up the audio on your phone, on your laptop, however you're listening in right now. But just go ahead and begin to notice how you feel as you lie all the way down. And this meditation is a metaphor for the different storms that we endure in life. And as we talk about all the time checking in with our own weather, the different storms we face in our life, we often don't have control of, of how they come in, when they come in, but we do have control of how we respond to them. And so this metaphor is a great one when we're talking about low mood states and depression. But as you're reclining, go ahead and gently close your eyes and just begin to notice your breathing. And notice how when we tune into our breathing, naturally our breath will begin to deepen. Maybe we start feeling those deeper belly breaths. And noticing if we can send the breath more to the base of the lungs instead of the shallow, anxious, nervous breathing that is more towards the throat. But just allowing yourself to feel into the breath. As we transition into this mindful metaphor of sheltering from the storm, 
by beginning to listen to the audio. And right away, noticing how you feel as you begin to tune in to this scene in your mind. Noticing where your breath is, how you feel emotionally as you begin to tune in and listen to the storm. Just taking in this rich soundscape, listening to all the different sounds water droplets can make. Imagining and painting a picture of this rain in your mind. Hearing those rumbles of thunder as they boom across the land and make it right into your ear as you mindfully listen with curiosity. but just practicing that beginner's mind and listening as if you're hearing for the first time, taking in all these rich sounds. And moving to a place within yourself where you're not fearing the rain. You're not fearing the storm as you begin to draw an image of where you are as you safely observe this storm. And allowing your mind to not fear the storms of our life, but no matter how loud they boom and come sweeping in, that we can face them and know that we can take them on and adjust accordingly. So not being stuck in judgment about the storm, but not avoiding the storm either by ignoring it, pretending it's not there. But what we're gonna do in the mind is build a shelter from the storm, a place where we can be protected and yet still observe and watch the storm pass by. So in building your shelter in your mind, start imagining what you would like to put in your shelter, what you would like in there so you can make it through as the storm passes. Maybe you want to put in the shelter things that regulate you, things that keep you grounded. Maybe fill in your shelter with visions of exercise, walking. Maybe you want in your shelter a specific family member or friend or loved one but just starting to imagine all the things you want in your shelter that help you feel grounded as you let this storm of your life pass by. Maybe you fill it with journals, allowing you to emotionally release from this experience. Maybe you wanna cultivate your compassionate coach through writing. Maybe you're filling your shelter and painting a vivid picture with small things that keep you grounded, like a scented candle, a warm blanket, a funny movie. But just keeping your breathing nice and deep as you begin to paint a mental picture of all the things you need in your shelter to allow the storm to pass by. Maybe you're even picturing 
funny YouTube channels. Hobbies that you enjoy that allow you to feel connected. Maybe it's art projects, reading good books, but just filling your shelter with all the things that you've come to learn about yourself that allow you to feel present, grounded, and at peace. as we've been imagining all the great protective things in the shelter, the storm rages on. The rain continues to fall. The thunder has continued to rumble. But inside this shelter, we are safe and protected by all the things that we need to allow the storm to pass. Looking around your shelter of all these different things that represent your stability, your groundedness. I'm taking a nice deep breath through the nose, breathing in this protection, this wisdom that you've cultivated Breathing out all the judgment that can be there when we move through different lows, different depressions of our life. Taking a nice deep breath, inhale in, breathing in this strength this resilience that we cultivated, breathing out completely, letting go of trying to control the storm in any way, shape, or form. And then just spending these final few minutes in your beautiful shelter that you've cultivated by looking inward, becoming curious about yourself and what keeps you regulated. And just spend these final few minutes allowing the storm to pass by listening to all the sounds of the rain from a protective, safe place. Keeping our breathing nice and deep as we don't fight against the storm, but instead we slowly let it fade out into the distance as we slowly come back into this moment together. Noticing that all the storms of our life slowly fade and let up and pass by. And yet our shelter of wisdom, of all the things that we've learned about ourselves that allow us to feel more grounded, more regulated, are still there providing us safety whenever we need them. Slowly open your eyes, noticing your room as a whole. Giving yourself thanks for taking this pause. Thinking and cultivating the truth that lies inside of you, that you are enough. To allow the different storms and seasons of our lives to move through. And that we can be protected. And that we can go inward and go to those places of knowing where we can feel again very grounded and at peace as anything can move by in our life.
Thanks for taking this pause with me, cultivating the stillness of the shelter and knowing that the shelter is always there for you whenever you need it. Ah, Anytime I can listen to the sound of rain, it regulates me and brings me into this peaceful place. But for you, it could bring up anything. That's part of the practice. It can bring up different things each time we jump in. Um, If you're an FAU student and you're taking this as a course, check the description down below and you'll see the contact information for counseling and psychological services. It's completely free, completely confidential. If you're ever going through depression or a low mood state, anxiety, anything at all, give them a call, contact them. Even right now, they're doing online therapy. If you're not in the course, I have some other links down below for you. BetterHelp, Psychology Today, it'll allow you to find a therapist in your zip code. Wherever you are out there, if you ever need help, I hope you connect with somebody. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.